not to be intimidated. Yes. You walk around here, you see policemen and women with their guns. You see security agents with their guns. And I ask you, where are you when we are being kidnapped? Where are you when we are being killed? Where are you when they're throwing spanking fingers in our eyes? Where are you when all the bad things are happening in Nigeria? You come out with your guns. You come out standing. You tell us you're men. You tell us you're women. But you're just wimps. You are doing nothing. Nigerians are no more safe on the streets. Nigerians are no more safe in their houses. Nigerians are not safe anywhere. It is protesters that come out that you come out and intimidate. You will not be intimidated. Yes. No Nigerian is more Nigerian than any Nigerian. That's right. That's right. Every one of us occupy the highest office in this land. And that is the office of the citizen. The president occupies the highest political office. So his office is less than our office. Oh, yeah. I am an employer of the president. Oh, yeah. I pay the president's salary. Yeah. I pay the bills of his family. And he must protect me, whether he likes it or not. As the commander in chief, the president has failed. How many police were killed by terrorists in Bono? What have you guys done? Nothing. I needed to see my commander in chief. Be yes. one. Yes. I needed yes. to see all of you. Yes. Go after yes. Sheikhau and bring Sheikhau yes. out. Yes. You're standing yes. here yes. with yes. front of protesters. We have a whim. Yes. And soldiers have been killed all over. Madam, your colleague has just been killed. Yes. What have you done Nothing. about it? Yeah. We all are suffering. And as you're waiting here, the next phone call might come and they will say they've picked your child. Yes. What will you do? God will not forgive, forbid. You know why, madam? Because those people it happened to, they too pray. Yes. The only way God will forgive is by us using what God has given us. We cannot be praying. We cannot be a nation of praying people. We call ourselves the most populous country in Nigeria. Absolutely. Really? But when it comes to protest, we are the least populous country. Absolutely. Because we have cowards as citizens. Yes. Oh, yes. People who are afraid to die. Yes. Are we living in Nigeria? No. Is this life? This is not life. I spent seven months in the UK. I just came back two weeks ago. I just finished my 14 days quarantine. You know what? I wasn't treated as a slave in another man's land. So who was there to treat me as a slave in my own country? Because we call out those who fail. Every day you get a phone call from someone in the middle of the night mm. telling you that they need money for health care, mm. they need money for school fees, Nigeria's they story. need money for this and that. Nigeria's, Nigeria's make demands on fellow citizens, but they dare not make demands on the government Shame. that yeah. are failing them, that yeah. are looting them, mm. that are packing their things away. It is yes. high time we begin to do tough law. Yes. Oh, yes. Enough of the nonsense. Yes. Where some people will stay at home, they expect us to put our lives on the line, no, and then yes. they will call and tell us to bring money. People have been making excuses. All you yesterday, what was on social media? Oh, sure, what is the one doing it? They will not come. Henry Sheed is the one doing it. They will not come. Oh, Adi and is the one doing it. They will not come. Oh, Adi is the one doing it. They will not come. You know what? Excuses are like shoes, and you always find the one that fits. Yeah, yeah. It's time for us to stand as a nation. Yeah. I'm tired of being afraid in my country. Yeah. I'm tired of hiding in my house. I'm tired of paying unnecessary school fees. I'm tired of paying bills. How much is the tight care that they pay? What would you buy? A bag of rice? Yes. And that's it? And then we'll have a president who has the guts to do nothing, and yet he sent in and security agents to come and intimidate us. You all should be ashamed of yourself. Yeah, you all should be ashamed Very of yourself. Ashamed. You all should look at yourself and let the tears fall back because we are killing this nation. Yeah. Matter how much do they pay you? Nothing. How much is your yeah, food? Yeah, they take all their money. How much do they take all of their welfare? They are living dirty barracks. The child of the president and the child of the policeman should have equal, equal rights right in this country. Yes. They should have access to good quality education. Absolutely. How much is the school fees in Regent where most of them have their children? You see us on the streets. You think we are hungry. That's why we're, we're not hungry. hungry. We aren't. We, we are, are angry. And that's why. The people that are hungry, the people who are stealing 
our money. How much you pay to your school they are the fees? hungry people. How much is your salary? How much do you Nonsense. pay for your children's school fees? Do your children get the same access to good quality education like your children? No. That's why we are here. So the next time they send you to protest us and tell you to put up And you come out with guns. Ahead, think about it. And the thing is that as long as we are committed people, it doesn't matter the numbers. Yes. The numbers have never mattered. to start. Good morning from Austin, Texas in the United States. My name is Anna Lee Carruthers and I am the organizer of the Toy and Falola interviews. Welcome. In this series, Dr. Falola, globally renowned scholar and professor, will interview scholars and policymakers whose work and research are particularly relevant for the African continent and its peoples, including the diaspora. Dr. Falola will also discuss the scholars' most recent books with them. The ultimate goal in this series is to promote the work of great minds and to spread knowledge to the general public about current intellectual projects that these great minds are pursuing. Research themes can include, but are not limited to the following, African affairs, African migration, religion, culture, intellectual history, development issues, theories, women's rights, disability rights, post-colonial society in Africa and other parts of the global South and globalization. These discussions will be recorded over Zoom and these recordings will be distributed on the Toy and Falola network, Facebook page, Twitter and website. These recordings will also be posted on YouTube. Thank you very much for joining us today for this episode and we hope that you enjoy. Thank you very much for joining us. It's my pleasure to introduce Aisha, but only in three sentences. She's a very prominent activist and she was involved in Bring Back Our Girls, involved in the recent Ed's End Slash and Sass. And yesterday she criticized the Nigerian judiciary uh, for their role in consolidating abuses of power. I'm the moderator and we have a series of programs lined out. Tabo Mbeki, the former president of South Africa, has agreed to join us for a series and we are negotiating the date. And we thank all the participants for coming more. We join as the event unfolds. Because of time difference, Sunday is not a convenient time for people who go to church. We apologize for that. Let me start the first question. Please, can you introduce yourself to, to our audience, talk about yourself and what led you to activism? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor, for having me. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to be here uh, today. Uh, my name is Aisha Yusufu. Uh, I was born and brought up uh, in Kanu in the northern part of Nigeria. I'm actually from Edo State, the southern, south southern part of Nigeria. Um, I grew up in Kano, I grew up in a ghetto. And most times people ask me, why are you like this? And I always say to them, this is who I've always been. I've always been a child. Even as a child, I was one who was vocal, who asked questions and always asked the question why. So it got me into a lot of trouble growing up. Uh, I, I, I grew up in a ghetto. Um, just to give a context of, of, of my life, at the age of 11, I didn't have any girlfriend. 
The reason why I didn't have any girlfriend was because all my friends were married off. I got married when I was 24. My, my friends were already grandmothers at that time. I lived in a place where education was not seen as important, especially for the girl child. And uh, it was such a, I was mocked, I was abused and all sorts of work because I decided to go to school. And uh, my parents growing up, I grew up poor. My father lost his business and lost everything. And uh, life was quite very difficult. And I would go to school in the morning without breakfast, coming back home. I wasn't expecting lunch. But I was one person who, even though in the ghetto, I read a lot and I wanted a life out of that. And I always would um, talk about it and the fact that there's a world out there. I always wanted to go uh, traveling all over the world. As a teenager, I, I, I said to myself, I was going to travel the world. And uh, in 2014, my mom called me and she said to me, thank you. Thank you for dreaming for the whole family. And sometimes when I see people say to me, why do you believe so much in Nigeria? Things will not work out. I always say Nigeria will work in my lifetime. Nigeria must work in our lifetime. And for me, I said to them, I've, all, I've never had anything given to me on a platter of gold. I've always had to believe, even when my dreams were bigger than the people around me, but I held on to that, those dreams. And somehow they did come true. Uh, so growing up uh, in, in a place called Kwanahudo uh, in Kano, which I like to call the Ajegule of, of, of Le of Kano, I could, it resonated with me when uh, Chibogas were abducted. And I realized that that was who I was um, as of the time that the Chibogas abduction happened in 2000, uh, 2014. That was 23 years ago. I was also writing the same exam. And I said to people, if I was taken away, my parents would never have been able to say anything. They wouldn't have had a voice to speak out to make demands. Because we live in a country where if you're poor, you're faceless, you're nameless, you're voiceless, and you're not seen as a human being. The only time that you're important as a poor person in Nigeria is only during election when they need your thumbprint. And they don't see you as a whole human being. What they see is the thumbprint. And so for me, I, I, when I started fighting for Chibok girls, I started on the basis of uh, uh, I, if my child was taken away, I would be there. But less than a month into it, I knew I was fighting for the little girl that I was. And I said to myself, I will never give up on Chibok girls because to give up on Chibok girls would be to give up on the little girl that I was, who, who was begging for help, who asked for help and nobody uh, answered. Growing up poor, well, I knew I needed financial independence and I worked really hard for that. And uh, December 2013, 12th December 2013, I, I was 40. That was my 40th birthday. And I realized that I had become the problem of Nigeria. How did I become the problem of Nigeria? By my silence. The little girl that I was, who, is, who was now 40 years, and who had now turned 40, sort of like forgotten how she was as a little girl and she was angry at Nigeria. I hated my country because my country then there was, and still is there, there was so much injustice, corruption, poverty. And I felt we were rich enough as a nation for that not to be the case. And I was always mad at the adults around me who seemed to do nothing. And here I was on my 40th birthday, I realized that I too had become that adult who wasn't doing anything. And I said to myself, Never again will I keep quiet on national issues. At this stage, I have gotten my financial independence and I knew I needed to focus on what was happening in the nation. And four months after, Chibok girls happened. And that was when I came out to speak on national issues for the first time and I haven't looked back since then. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to invite Professor Abimbola Delakun to ask the first set of questions. Um, because the way we are going to arrange the podcast is that each segment will be separate uh, to make it um, more user-friendly. If you are a Nigerian, I don't have to introduce um, Dr. Delakun. She's a major columnist. She writes for Punch once a week. And um, she's been in the ton of flesh of many people, uh, whether it's Tinumbu or Buari and all of them. Um, she had a PhD in theater and dance here at the University of Texas at Austin. 
also specializing in the African African diaspora. And she holds two master's degree, one from the University of Ibadan and one from the University of Texas uh, on diaspora studies, communication, and language arts. Our current works are now in the area of modern African cultures, performance, and she has a forthcoming book on Pentecostalism with the University of Cambridge Press. Thank you so much for joining us to interview her. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Falola. I'm really grateful to you for organizing this. It's a really, really great privilege to be here this Sunday morning. And thanks to everyone that is present here. It's, it's a good place to be on this today. Um, Ms. Yesufu, I'm really, really thrilled to meet you. I have followed you since the days of Bring Back Our Girls, and I have always, always wanted to meet you. And I'm glad we are doing so this morning. Yes, even though we are social, <laughs> virtual distancing, but it's still a, a great pleasure to meet you. Good morning. Thank so you. Good I'm, morning. <laughs> yeah. So I have always been curious about your backstory. Like, who is this woman, and what are the things that drive her? What's your passion? And thank you for um, talking about yourself and the things that push you. And um, it's really interesting to see uh, how, how much you have done and how much more we are all stimulated to do more, right? Because we are all driven by this passion to see a better mm -hmm. Nigeria. So on the NSAS protest, I, I, I have one of my questions that I have about it is that it, one of the hallmarks was the that it was a leaderless revolution, right? Even mm -hmm. though you were one of the prominent faces and um, like I could say an iconic face, especially with a picture of the raised fist. But at the same time, one of the things that really troubled the way we do protest in Nigeria was that it was a leaderless revolution. So I am very curious about what a leaderless revolution, how you came about it. Was it something that you, you planned to be leaderless or it was spontaneous? Because a leaderless revolution is a very radical vision of democracy and participation and the way we do things. So how did you come about the idea of leaderless revolution and um, what are the lessons you learned from not having a leader? Uh, oh, okay. Uh, so one of the things that uh, I, I try to explain is the fact that, uh, yes, I was part of the NSAS uh, protest, but I'm not an organizer or I'm not one of the organizers of, of the NSAS. And the, on the issue of the leaderless, uh, be it being a leaderless protest, um, I, I, I tend to look at it, it's not leaderless in the way that the word is, it's just that it's not the traditional kind of leadership that we are used to. Where one person stays is, is known as the leader, and then the other ones are the followers and all of that. And I think this came from the fact that there's so much uh, suspicion and that there's so much distrust in, in, in leadership in Nigeria. Because over the over the years, a lot of people have believed and they have gotten, they have hoped that they have gotten good leadership and it has been dashed. And so uh, many are suspicious of that. And you find out that there are always uh, protests or movements that have gone on before. And you find out that people uh, will sort of like sell out. So looking at what happened Occupy Nigeria and, and, and all of that. So it just sort of like, I would say it started uh, spontaneously, not that it was planned for that way, but it, it just started over time. Because first of all, uh, if you remember, the NSAS protests actually started in Ugeli, the first few ones. This is not the first time there has been NSAS protests. They went one, I think, around 2017. Not many people uh, turned, turned up for that at the Unity Fountain in Abuja. So this started from Ugeli. And then Omoyele uh, Showere, uh, you did a tweet and said, oh, can we do, we need to do protests all around uh, the country. And then there was this decision that came up and they said, okay, let them do three days protest, 72 hours from 7th to 9th uh, of, of October. And then uh, the first tweet I would see that went or was that was from, it was in Kanu, a young man in Kanu called Adamu Ismail put up and said, okay, they were coming out on the 7th of uh, October to do uh, a, a protest in, 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 in Kanu. Even though it, it ended up, it was, it was only two of them that turned up, a lot of people were afraid in Kanu. So on that 7th, only two people came up. But later uh, the, later on, when he, he did, I know he called for another one and hundreds of people uh, turned up for that one. So we had this protest going on in Ugeli, um, at Lagos, uh, at, at Alausa, these young Nigerians uh, came out, they were doing their own protest too. 
And then on the 8th of, uh, of October in Abuja, we did a protest, the NSAS protest. And so we, we went there and, and did that too. When we finished that, on the night, another group of uh, young Nigerians came out. And ironically, they actually formed the, they said they formed their WhatsApp group at 2 a.m. on that uh, uh, that day. And then by the later in the day, they came out and they did that protest. And that was when police attacked them in Abuja. They tear gas them and they chased them away. So I didn't even know that protest was going to go. So I got, I was called and I was informed. So when we heard that they were attacked, uh, Dr. Obi called me and said, what's going on here? And she, was, she wasn't even feeling very uh, uh, fine. And then we ended up, we went to see the IG of police, myself, Dr. Obi, the facility, and more recovery. We had a meeting with him and we said, why were protesters being at why why are they being attacked? This shouldn't happen. And of course he was like, oh, okay, no, he even called the commissioner uh, of um, commissioner of police in Lagos, and then another, I can't remember which other commission. We we shall have the whole of that talk. But before then, uh, like the video that was played, that was on October 1st, when we'd had uh, a, a, a protest. So the next day, the, the, the Abuja uh, youth said they were still going to come out. And that was when I joined them at that protest. And I went with them. Even when I was at the protest, because this is, like I said, the NSAS protest is strictly a protest of the youth. They organized it. They did this. All the organization, everything came from them. I sat at the back almost throughout that day. It was when the police uh, wanted to attack them that I now moved to the front. And I stood and I said to the police, you can't do that to them. And if you're going to put a bullet through uh, to them, you have to put that bullet uh through through me too and so that sort of that sort of like uh went on and then at the alausa the protests were going on and before you knew what, what was happening there was this all of the uh, protests coming in and then the feminist coalition came up with that organizational structure where we saw the organization the world they took care of welfare security uh and, and, and all of that okay thank you very much um so on the leaderless uh, revolution, still a, a second question, was mm -hmm. that one of the criticism was that when government wanted to talk to people, there was no one to talk to because everybody kept saying, we have no leader. Was that in retrospect, was that a, um, a positive or a negative? Because it's, it's a, a criticism that keeps recurring in all the um, post-mortem fences protests. Uh, so one of the things that I said in the video that was played earlier, I said, look, excuses are like shoes and you always find the one that fits. And so when people are looking for something that they can hold on to, they will always find uh, an excuse. Yes, like I said, the movement, they, they were all leaders in that movement. They didn't have the traditional kind of movement. They didn't move. But the anti protesters were always at the negotiating table. So first of all, when the protest started, there was violence from the government. Uh, when we, even we met, when we met with the IG of police on the 9th of uh, October, uh, I remember we gave him. These are the things you needed to do. He had agreed that he was going. He was going to wait because there was election in Ekiti. You no, know, the day after was it was election in Ekiti. After the election, he was going to address the protesters, the things that they were going to come up with, and everything. But yet, it took. It was on the 11th of October that the IG of police finally addressed the issue and said that the uh, SARS had been disbanded. When he said SARS had been disbanded, uh, he brought out what they call five, uh, five things that we need to know about SARS being disbanded. On that same 11, a movement that supposedly doesn't have leadership came up with their five for five. And they had their five for five demands. So when you're talking about uh, a negotiation, it's no longer the traditional one where everybody has to be at the table. These are uh, uh, protesters who were multitasking while they were protesting, they had their demands and they handed it over to government, which was take care of those demands. What are these five demands? Every, all, protest, all protesters that had been arrested uh, must be free. Uh, they, they talked about the fact that there must be uh, justice uh, for, for those that have been killed and compensation for the families. Uh, there should be, uh, there should be police incre uh, increase in, in, in salaries. There should be uh, uh, what, what was the other thing now? Psychological evaluation for members of SARS before they are even uh, taken uh, taken to other units because the police had said that they will be deployed to other units and they insisted that you, you need to mentally evaluate, the psychologically evaluate them first before uh, taking them there. And then of course also prosecution of, of the uh, officers that had been found uh, wanted. That's why there are five demands, nothing more. And so the demands were there. 
And the president, though they said they had accepted the demands, but they said you even while the, the killings were going on before the protest, the killings were going on during the protest, and the killings have been going on after the protest. The harassment were going on before the protest, during and after the protest. And the and, and the protesters said, look, we are not saying sincerity of purpose here. This is not the first time that SARS has been disbanded. SARS was disbanded uh, in 2017, December. It was disbanded 2018, 2019. And then, yeah, at one time, the name was changed from SARS. By the way, SARS means Special Anti-Robbery Squad to Federal Special Anti-Robbery Squad, FSAS. Yet, nothing happened. The people who are supposed to prevent robbery now actually turn to robbers using uh, the uh, arms given to them by the state to oppress people, extort people, and get them to transform on them. Even when uh, victims came out and said, this is what had happened to them, this is what SARS had done to them, they actually brought out account numbers where they had transported, uh, transferred money to nothing uh, happened. So they said they needed to see uh, all of this being done before they, they went up this, yet nothing happened. On the 19th of October, a week after the 5 for 5 demand, there was that implementation of 5 for 5. And then the, the NSAS protesters put out what had been done. They put out the things that they needed to be done, what they wanted now, what they wanted in the short to mid term, and then what they wanted in the mid to long term. So you see, it's not, there was, there was leadership. They were actually working. They were coming to the negotiating table. It's the government that was making all sorts of excuses. And if you tell me, and I would tell you candidly, that it was the Nigerian government that didn't have leadership, and up to now, the Nigerian government hasn't shown a, a, any leadership. It's not the, it's not the NSAS protesters. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's, that's very clarifying. So I have another um, one more question and I will pull back. Um, so um, one of the things that the government offered was were judicial panels and then it, one in Lagos especially has functioned like some kind of truth and reconciliation commission. But even while that was going on, they are still going after the feminist coalition and some of the NSAS um, protesters. So how do we engage the government on their promises for reforms while they are also backstabbing us in the process of you know reforms? Thank you. Thank you so much. So this is the reason why the, the uh, NSAS protesters did not leave the streets when they were told to leave the streets because they have seen over and over again no sincerity of purpose this is not the first panel that was set up and i think that's one of the things that the governor of river state has said is that what is the essence of this panel the set up panel there are findings there are indictments and then nothing comes out of it a lot of other panels that were set up before and they indicted uh, so, for example, Yusuf, uh, there's someone called Yusuf Kolo. He's in the, he's, he's, he's actually still in the police force and he has been promoted and nothing has, co has come out of it. So there was all of that. Uh, people were skeptical about the whole panel. But then one major issue is that the National Human Rights Commission for the last five years has not had, had a governing council. And without the governing council, people have said, have questioned the legality of this panel. What is the essence of doing all of this panel? And then at the end of the day, even if people are indicted, they will co come out and question the legality of the whole uh, panel. And they will have nothing. Because as it is, the, the, the national chairman does not, the, the chairman of the National Human Rights Commission, the executive chairman, does not have the right as mandated by the law to set up uh, this panel because right now there is no governing council. And so that, that has been uh, a major issue. But let's also look back at the fact that in 2018, uh, a presidential panel was set up to look into the reform of uh, SARS. And what was this uh, presidential panel uh, all, all about? It came from the fact that there were complaints from citizens, complaints from uh, civil society organization about the uh, human rights abuses by, by SARS and the extrajudiciary killings and all of that, and the president set up the panel. In June 2019, the panel submitted their reports, and then the president tweeted about it and said they were going to uh, 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 implement the recommendation from that panel. It's, this is the 17th month now, and nothing has been done. And so it just goes to say that, oh, they're just just doing this because really that they don't even care that's just the word we're we are saying we've seen uh, uh the uh see, from the office of the attorney general of the federation coming out to say that they don't have evidence to indict 
the, the people, the, the SARS officers uh, who have been indicted to prosecute the SARS officers who are the 37 of them who have been in, indicted so, so, so far. There, there is, there is, there is, even there's no, there's a systemic abuse that nobody is ready to, 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 to bother about. And they're not ready, the government is not ready to take responsibility on that. And what they have focused their attention more on is on, is, is on coming after uh, NSAS protesters. We've seen uh, people have been picked up. People's accounts have been frozen. There were some of, of them were frozen as far back as 15th, 13th of uh, October when money was being uh, sent from a uh, feminist coalition to take care of the state uh, chapters uh, protest that, that were going on. So all of this has been happening. And one thing I, I would just, even though you didn't ask the question, which I would just state here categorically, many people say that the NSAS protests have been infiltrated. And I say categorically to them, the NSAS uh, protest was never and hasn't been infiltrated. What happened was that government brought in talks, government sponsored talks came and attacked NSAS protesters. Why do I say they are government sponsored talks? These talks were brought in in military vans. They were brought in in police vans. They were brought in in security uh, agents' vans, uh, uh, Prados and Jeeps. They were even supervised by police. Why they attacked, why they attacked the NSAS protesters and destroyed their uh, properties and even killed some. Why that was going on, the police refused to do anything they stood by. When the end, some of the NSAC protesters were able to apprehend some of these dogs and handed them over the, to the police, the police refused uh, to, to collect them. We have a video where some of them had gone to meet the NSAC protesters where they were occupying the, the central bank of Nigerian head office in Abuja. And they came in and they destroyed their vehicles, even burnt a van over there. They even had wanted to destroy other buildings, but in that vehicle, you could see the people who brought them in, calling them in. And all of this was done under the supervision of the police that is supposed to be law uh, law enforcers. They became lawbreakers and uh, supervised those who were also uh, breaking law. And at the end of the day, these talks went, went through and they started destroying uh, things in the country. And I see the government as much as possible trying to put the blame on the protesters. No, it isn't. And finally, I would also say, we have seen the kind of government we have, where there's no sincerity of purpose, where they will try to gaslight everything, where they will, they will deny things and then come and change it. We saw what happened, the massacre that happened on the 20th of October, 2020. The military said, first of all, they weren't there. Later, they said they came at the calling of the uh, uh, Lagos State Governor, and then they said, oh, it was it was blanks. They shot uh, the attorney general of the federation have come to say, oh, it was hoodlums in military uniform that were there. All of this have continu continued to happen. There's no sincerity of purpose. Even the panel that was set up, we saw when they wanted to go to the morgue of one of the military hospitals in, in, in Lagos, and they were refused uh, entry entry into, to, to go and check the morgue. So at the end of the day, we really wonder whether this panel, we, we, we give we give justice uh, to the people who deserve justice. Thank you very much. Um, I, I could go on and on. I have so much to ask you, but they t my time is off. So I have to cycle back to Dr. Falola. Thank you very much. So Thank yes, you. Please. Thank you. Finally, a pleasure to see you. You yes. look different from the big picture that I'm used to seeing. Well <laughs> Thank done. you. Great. So good to see you. Okay. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Uh, we go into we go to Canada to bring a professor, Professor Timitopo Riola, who yeah, uh, it's my brother. I know him from is my brother. Was also involved in the Bring Back Our Girls. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now editor of the Journal of African Security, professor University of Abata, and is famous there. He's received the Governor General Academic Gold Award. Um, and he's done important books and essays. One of the ones I enjoyed very much is The Politics of Kidnapping Oil Workers. Uh, and he wrote um, a manuscript on Boko Haram as well. Thank you so much, Professor Oriola, for joining us. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Professor uh, Tony Falola. I appreciate uh, being here and thanks to um, everyone uh, for joining. I can see a number of faces. Um, uh, Adria, Sanu. <laughs> well, that's, yeah, it's a yeah. pleasure seeing you. Yeah, it's, it's good to uh, see you once again. 
Uh, for full and proactive disclosure uh, for members of the audience, uh, I met uh, Adria Aisha as far back as 2015 uh, while conducting research on the PBOG. And, um, and as a participant observer, we went on multiple uh, marches on the streets of Abuja, and I had the, um, the pleasure of interviewing her on multiple occasions. So this is a, a bit of an informal uh, reunion. It's so good, so good to see you, Ajia. Um, Thank so you. Like to, yeah, you're welcome. I'd like to start off from uh, the BBOG advocacy and create, um, uh, if I may, um, a link, and if there is any, between that and the NSAS movement. Uh, do you see any link between the Bring Back Our Girls uh, advocacy and the NSAS movement? Absolutely. Um, the link that I see is that of resilience and that of uh, where people understand that they can stay on and they can make demands and they, that they have a voice. And so, so for me, uh, you know, just meeting some of the NSAS uh, protesters and you know they keep talking about the fact that oh they kept seeing us coming out even though we were attacked severally uh, we refused uh, to go to go home uh, we, we we stayed on so for me I would say th that's where that link is because one of the things that uh, the bring back our girls movement was able to do to Nigerians is that it let people understand that they have a voice and that they are the ones that are supposed to speak out and the people needed to occupy their offices of the citizen uh, that that's very uh, 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 it's, it's instructive. But one thing is that there's a bit of difference in, in, in the two movements. And there's similarity also in the fact that the Bring Back Our Girls movement uh, is women-led, and then the feminist coalition played a very important part in the NSAS protest. And for me, personally, I would say without them, the protest wouldn't have gone as, as far as it did. That's all organizational skills that they brought in was uh, was very uh, amazing but beyond but uh, beyond that the two protests are pro are different very different in, in the way so you see bring back our guest movement and other protests that we've had it's a protest of empathy so something has happened somewhere or you feel some or oh, this shouldn't happen to people and people were there but the the but the NSAS protest was a protest of survival. It's a protest of survival. And it is Florence Ozo, one of the Bring Back Our Girls movement, uh, one of the Bring Back Our, Bring Back Our Girls uh, movement member and the current chairperson that made that uh, analogy that, and said, look, this protest is a protest of survival because you find out that a lot of the people who are the What's going on? Oh, sorry, um, I believe it might be her internet connection, but she should probably be back soon. Okay, okay she's, she's uh, back. Okay, uh, um, okay, I didn't know I had internet uh, issues. So, am I back? Am I good? Yeah, back. Yes. Uh, okay, so I was trying to make the connection uh, a bit, a, a, a stark difference between the uh, Bring Back Our Girls uh, movement uh, uh, protest and the NSAS uh, protest. The Bring Back Our Girls protest was protest of empathy and good number of other protests we had, but the NSAS protest was a protest of survival. And this, you know, it, the, the current uh, chairperson of the Bring Back Our Girls movement, Florence Ozo, was the one who put, uh, who made this uh, an analogy. And she's, and you're like, look, in the case of NSAS, people were being killed. They were being killed. The culture of silence is, is unbelievable. And they were being killed under the cover of darkness. And they were tired of being killed. And they came out just to demand for, for them to be allowed to leave. You find that many of them had been victims many times over in multiple states. Uh, some of them had family members who had been victims. Some of them, they, some of their, one of the, uh, for example, one of the organizers uh, of the Abuja protest her brother has been missing since 2012 for eight years. And uh, at one time, they just said to the father, they, they made the father to sell things that he, he sold his property. He was able to raise 30 million naira. He took it to them and they said it was chicken chain. And later they said they had killed the boy and they forced him to go into a river that had a lot of, uh, a lot of um, uh, corpses to, to search for, 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 for his son. So there was that, there was that, uh, that, how do I put it now? The fact that for them, if this is survivor, this is personal, and this is something that they know if they don't do it, that the police, they're going to come after them with more force. And that sort of like uh, kept them going. And I think that's a bit of a, a difference between the NSAS protest 
and also the Bring Back Power Girls Project. All right, uh, thank you, Adia. Uh, my next question uh, is about outcomes, um, movement outcomes. Uh, how would you rate the results of the uh, Bring Back Our Girls movement in terms of what it's been able uh, to accomplish? Um, and to put it bluntly, um, do you think uh, the Bring Back Our Girls movement is in decline? And um, I would like you to cross articulate that with what you think might be um, the, the, the outcomes of the NSAS movement. What do you think would be uh, the results of the NSAS movement vis-a-vis -vis your experiences uh, within the Bring Back Our Girls movement? Well, in the case of the Bring Back Our Girls movement, uh, the, it's, it's, um, it's about 5,900 and something days right now since the girls were, were abducted. And it's going to be seven years in, in, in April. One of the things that the government uh, have done is that uh, they, they have bothered, they have no bother to listen and the government has moved on. Even though the Bring Back Our Girls movement, we've continued, we're still, we're still out there, we're still making demands. Uh, we, the, these uh, street uh, protests, the sit out that we normally have was stopped during, because of the pandemic, during uh, the, the, the lockdown. But the government hasn't bothered to, to do anything. And, and one of the reasons is because citizens allow them not to because people feel that it's none of their business. It doesn't concern them. And that's the reason why I always say to people, yesterday's victims were once survivors. Today's victims were yesterday's survivors and tomorrow's victims would be today's survivors. The question always is who is next? And I also remind people like the victim card is going around in Nigeria and sadly Nigeria today, being a victim is no longer a matter of if, it is a matter of when. And so people need to understand that this affects us all. In terms of the outcomes that have come with, it, there has been a whole lot. First of all, is this awareness that, that it has created amongst people, understanding the value of their voices. And you find out that there have been a whole lot more agitation, people demanding for, for their rights in, in one way or the other. That has really gone on in Nigeria. And you see most of them were attributed to the fact that the resilience of the Bring Back Our Address movement and just seeing us being on the streets all the time, making demands and, and, and all of that. Bring Back Our Address movement, I think, is, a, is the longest standing movement uh, in, in, in Nigeria uh, for, for now. And so that, that, that came up. And then we have 107 Chibok girls that are back. 276 were abducted on April uh, 14, 2014, and 57 of them escaped immediately. But then uh, over two, it took two years before the first, uh, the first uh, girl was found, Amina Ali in Keki. And today we have 107 of those Chibo, of our Chibok girls back. Uh, 112 of them sadly are still in captivity and we're always making demands for them because for us we say it is not a privilege for them to be rescued it is their right as enshrined in the constitution of the federal republic of nigeria and uh, we've had also other i think they were part of some of the matches we had for the uh for the or those that were taken away that went for exploration of oil the unimed lecturers the lassa we uh, lassa women all of these are some of the uh, 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 demands that we made consistently just being on the street. There were times that we were marching every day just to ensure that the government listened and, and, and some of them uh, have, been, have been brought back. We, we also have uh, something like the, the a missing persons register, even though it's not fully operational the way it should have since 2015, uh, July 8, 2015, we handed that to the, to the pre current president. In 2014, we, we, we tried, we, tried to give it to the president. Of course, the president then never met with us. We gave it to the representatives. Uh, the National Human Rights Commission was supposed to work on a missing persons register just for us to even know when our citizens are missing. These are the people, uh, these are who are missing and let the government be doing everything uh, they can uh, to, get that, to get them back. That, that, that has, hasn't happened. But I would say that the biggest thing for me is, the people, is that the fact that people owning their voices and that's what we need to do because one of the things we have demand, uh, governors like Dr. Obiaz of Kassili would say, it's made up of the demand and supply side. And the people who vote are those who are supposed to make demands and people voted for are supposed to make supplies. But sadly in Nigeria, many people, we don't make demands. And that is sort of like changing. And I see what NSAS has done also is to reinforce that belief that, you know, indeed uh, people can uh, own can own their voices and they can make demands for good governance and then they will do that. And that's uh, currently what is happening uh, right now. We have the partners going on. Uh, the youth of Nigeria have always been uh, called, one time called lazy by their own president. 
uh, many people have always said that they never bothered about the uh, bother about what is happening happenings in the country, but right now uh, they have bothered, and we've watched them being killed, and yet the rest of us we are really not standing for them and asking the government to stop uh, to stop uh, its tyranny and its oppression. Rather, what we see is people blaming the victims. Sadly, we are a country where we rather blame the victim rather than the perpetrator. So it's like why. Why did you even allow yourself to be killed instead of asking them, why are you uh, killing innocent uh, citizens who are simply the, the, uh, protesting the way the constitution allows? Right. Uh, thank you, Adia. Uh, my next question is about, um, again, the, the BBOG um, and uh, your identities. You were and are still widely uh, regarded as the mascot uh, of the uh, Bring Back Our Girls movement. You know, your distinctive ready job as a practicing Muslim woman, um, your business background, your level of education, your outspokenness within the Nigerian political system um, uh, present um, a confluence or to use um, uh, a very popular term, intersection of identities that is fairly extraordinary uh, within um, a, a highly patriarchal uh, society such as ours. So my question is, what is it like combining those identities? So one of the things that I do, for example, if, if, you, if, you, see, if you check uh, my bio on my Twitter handle, it says I am me, I don't do labels. And that I say it as it is. My mom says in my court, nobody wins. And I say, you would either love me or hate me and either one is perfectly okay. So for me, I don't do labels. So even when people try, so you are an activist. I'm not, no, I'm not an activist, I'm just me. I'm, I know I, I am an active Nigerian citizen, uh, but I am not an activist or whatever. So I don't live by the labels that people give me. I, for me, this is just it. Is there injustice? I'm gonna speak against it. Is there tyranny anywhere? I'm going to speak against it. Is there oppression anywhere? I'm going to speak against it. So I'm not going to look at, oh, am I a, am I a woman? Am I a man? Am I a Muslim? Am I non-Muslim? Am I this? I'm, for me, all those things are labels and they're not important. What matters the most is our humanity, our empathy, our, our, our shared humanity, of course, and social contracts we have with our government. And if they are not doing the right thing, of course, uh, I, I, I have to uh, speak up. So for me, I always get, you know, when people, some people will say one thing, oh, you are against Islam. And then some will say, oh, you're against Christianity. You're against this. I'm like, no, I'm not against anybody. I'm just with the truth. And we need to hear the truth. So for me, it's, it's, it's just who I am. And it's always been who, who I, who, whom I have been. And I'm, I'm particularly not bothered when people get worked up over all of those issues because I think I dealt with them as a child. As a child, I was a very vocal person. As a child, I always point out, or point out what is wrong. Even when my parents do it, when I felt that, oh, some of the things that they had done to us as children was unjust or to my siblings or anyone, I always spoke, spoke about that. And it got me into lots of trouble. And sometimes, even as a child, I realized that when the truth favors adults, they love it, they like you. When it doesn't favor them, they don't love you, they don't like you. And so I, I got used to not being not dependent on the... Um, was the word I, I'm looking for, on the validation from other people. So for me, it's about how do I see myself? How do I feel about myself? What I'm talking about, is it the right thing for me to talk about? That's all that happens. That's all that matters. And I hold myself to higher standards than I hold other people. And I always say to people, as long as I look in the mirror and I see the person in front of the mirror and I like what I see, that's okay with me. As long as I'm sitting there with my thoughts, and I love within me what my thoughts are. That, that's okay with me. Because at the end of the day, every one of us, we have a moral compass. Irrespective of what people say about you, you know what it is that it's really true that you're doing. And for me, that, that's the most important thing. And finally, I would just add to say that I always say to, you know, when people ask, say to me, how do you cope with the criticism? How do you cope with people, you know, insulting you and making all sorts of allegations or whatever? I say, look, to me personally, insults and praises are the same thing. They are people's opinion about me, they are not my reality. If I don't get angry when somebody prays me or prays for me, then I have no business getting angry when somebody criticize me or curse me. They are all their opinion. At the end of the day, what do I think about myself? That's what really matters. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Adria. I appreciate that. And I now turn things over to the convener and moderator, Professor Falola. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, I'm very grateful by keeping to time. You will allow us to 
uh, invite more people. There's so many great people uh, with us. Uh, I've seen one of our most distinguished um, uh, literary writers. Many of you probably know her very well. Uh, Akechi Zebo. If you have not read her work, you should. I've seen the Vice Chancellor of Fountain University, Cyril Obi, who is um, a program officer for social sciences in New York. I saw my daughter, Trubi Sola, who works for Open Society. Welcome for joining us. Uh, if I don't mention your name, it's not a slight. Uh, so I'm just telling you how heavy this is. I've seen the major, one of the heads of the psychiatrist division at Yaba Psychiatric Hospital. Premium Times has been represented. Uh, Bam Dele is here with us. Uh, we have Chisholm, we have um, Nduka, Ken Aro, all these uh, Chido, thank you for them being care of Rutgers. So this is a very high powered, um, high powered audience, which, which I truly like. Our last but not the least of the professors before we leave the professors alone is um, Professor Olaju Moke Aliso, who is very well known as well uh, in various capacities. She's, she's monitored elections in Nigeria. If you've been watching the last presidential elections, the elections, she was appearing on televisions almost every day. She works um, many times with Professor Jibril Ibrahim in the democracy movement. She's the current Dean of the School of Social Sciences at Babcock University. She writes on, um, on, on, on international relations and politics and Rhodes University has invited her for a sabbatical to come and teach beginning from January, attesting to her stature. Thanks so much and welcome, Professor Aliso. Thank you very much, Professor Pamela. Um, I do hope everyone can hear me. Um, and it's my pleasure, of course, to meet um, the great Aisha Yesufu. And um, I have to tell you that you, you, you almost crossed my heart a few minutes ago <laughs> when you said you do not see your identities. And I want to start my discussion from there that um, you do not see labels, rather, um, you would rather just be yourself um, because um, I, I want to take off from the point at which a lot of young people, a lot of women, and a lot of um, um, people from your part of the country see you as a role model specifically because of those, model, uh, those labels that you, you wish to reject. I don't know if you have a response to this before I ask about other specific issues. Uh, okay, so, so, so one of the things for me growing up was that I realized that uh, pe uh, people were limited with their labels, even as a child. So they would say to you, oh, you, you're the good child. And you know, they will pat your head, but you're not supposed to speak up. You're not supposed to make demands. When you make demands, you're not a good child. So I never wanted any of that. So it's a validation sometimes that they used to hold to hold one down. And then they will say to, oh, but you are a girl. Why are you doing this? Girls are not supposed to do this. Oh, you are this. And so I felt, I right from a very young age, I didn't want to have anything to do with that. Whatever you see me as, that's your own personal business. I just know that I'm this human being who is on earth to do, to live my life, and I need to do that. So I, 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 I deliberately just refuse to hold on to those labels because you see that people want to box you with their expectation into a particular place, and then they want you to stay, they want to limit you there. So it's like, oh, some people even say to me, oh, but you, why, have you abandoned Bring Back Our Girls movement? Why are you speaking on NSAS? Whenever I take on any issue, oh, why are you speaking on this issue? I'm like, how? You don't, you don't own my voice, you don't own me. The fact that I spoke, the first time you saw me was Bring Back Our Girls movement, doesn't mean that oh, that's only what I'm supposed to talk about. I can't talk on, 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 on uh, other issues. So for me, it was something that I deliberately did as a child because I grew up in a society where as a woman, you are supposedly limited. I remember my father initially 
who uh, felt that, oh, his no daughter of his would go beyond secondary school. So we are supposed to, after secondary school, we are supposed to go and get married. And it was something that I never wanted. I'm like, why would a male, my male counterpart be the one to go to school and I wouldn't go to school? When I actually finished my secondary school, I wanted to go to the uh, Nigerian Defense Academy. And I was told that women are not allowed to go because I wanted to be in the military. And I was told that women are not allowed to, to go. And I, uh, girls are not. And I was really angry. And I felt, why would you do that? So for me, that was the deliberate, uh, for me, it's maybe, I don't know whether to call it a survivor skills or that the way I've, I've been, that I don't want anybody's labor. This is just who I am and I'm just me. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, let me just say that um, you do not have to be, <laughs> to have attended the Defense Academy to um, to fight <laughs> and defend and, um, um, and basically do what the military should be doing. What you're doing um, is, is indeed, um, commendable. Um, I am also intrigued by the continuities between um, the Bring Back Our Girls movement and mm. the, the current NSAS um, movement. Um, mm. I, I do not know to what extent you've said a lot about this, but perhaps just crystallize for us um, in a bit how the Bring Back Our Girls movement with its successes and um, if I may call it that, I wouldn't really call it that. Successes and uh, would I say aspirations since some of the expectations yeah. are still not met, yes. Um, mm -hmm. To what extent has this shaped your optimism expressed at the beginning of this session about the capacity of Nigeria for change going mm -hmm. forward for a better mm -hmm. future? Are you mm. more optimistic, less optimistic? And then we have the NSAS movement and the violent crackdown. Do you retain the optimism with which on your 40th birthday, by the way, I am looking at my 40th birthday in two weeks or so. <laughs> and so hearing you say that, I'm thinking, should I do something revolutionary now too? <laughs> so, um, so just please speak to, to that. Uh, okay, uh, thank you so much. And we look forward to welcoming you to the 40s, even though I'm going <laughs> to be on my way out of the 40s anyway. Uh, yeah. So I, I think for me, I, I'm absolutely op optimistic. Uh, so maybe because of the kind of life that I had, like I said earlier, I've never had anything. Everything I have, I've had to fight. I mean, when I say fight, I mean fight, literally fight for everything in terms of my dreams, in terms of my goals, in terms of the kind of life I wanted to have, because I, I, was, I, was, I grew up in a place where I dreamt bigger than even my parents, bigger than my family. And it was so, and, and I'm sure sometimes I sit down like, oh, I, must, I must have been a difficult child because we're like, where did you come out from? We are here, we don't have anything and you're busy saying you want to travel the world. Travel the world when you don't even have a meal in your, in your stomach. And I remember my parents saying to me, my mom was well, we say, we just be able to stay in a man's house because I didn't like housework. Housework. I love to read books and all of that. So I got used to that. In 2014, like I mentioned earlier, my mom called me and said to me, thank you for dreaming for the whole family. So for me, I always see what, I, I say something, when you're living uh, history, it grinds so slowly. So in one sentence, we would say, uh, Nelson Mandela spent 27 years in, in prison and he came out to become president. That's one sentence, but 27 years, it's one second going into one minute, going into one hour, going into 24 hours, going into a day, going into a week, week going to months, months going into a year, years going to a de decade, first decade, second one, and seven, it's a long time. And so when you say things that are, for me, I always look at what are the positives that are happening? With the Bring Back Our Guest movement, it was amazing. For the first time, I realized, look, the lie that they say to us that Nigerians are not united, Nigerians can never come together and do something together, was a lie. At the Bring Back Our Guest movement, we were united. There were Nigerians from dif different tribes, different religion, different political parties, APC, PDP, and others were all there, different educational uh, qualification, different economic status, but we came together as one. And when we came together, we only had one singularity of purpose and that was bring back our girls. And so we were able to unite and work and work. And we did it, we are a self-funded movement that never received a dime from anyone. 
even when we won uh, the Emilio Mignoni uh, uh, humanitarian award given to us by the Argentinian government, we refused to collect the cash money that came with it. We collect the plaque and said no, because we are a self-funded movement. And we were able to do all, all of this and run, and run the movement. So, and people got their voices. And over the years from the Bring Back Our Guests movement, there have been different movements that have come from different members of the, of, of the Bring Back Our Guests movement doing different things. We have Mohammed Citizen, Mohammed Kiana, you know, fighting for the Almaty children. We have uh, someone like Buki Sean Ebare doing so many. So a lot of different organizations have, have, have come out from there. And beyond that also is that people have gotten to own their voices. People have gotten to see the importance of making demands that silence is not an option, not at all. And being passive citizen, it's never the way to, to grow a, a nation. And so that, that, that seriously happened. So I'm absolutely optimistic. And then with what happened with the NSAS movement, oh my goodness, I'm in awe of them. And I said to them, thank you. I did a tweet and I said to them, what my parents couldn't do for me, what I couldn't do for myself, you are doing it for us. You're coming together and you're doing this. You're fighting for Nigeria. You're standing united. You didn't say the wrongly. There was no fight. There was nothing focused on people's religion or people's choices or people's drive. It was just on the fact that they had a singularity of purpose, which was answered, and they went through it. And the way they were able to organize themselves, this shows us that indeed, if Nigeria gets the kind of right leadership and people putting people uh, square holes in square uh, square pegs in square holes, that we will get to the Nigeria uh, that we want. That it's not rocket science. We saw what, what the way the NSAS movement were able to organize themselves, provide uh, logistics, uh, well, they took care, welfare, security, health, because at one time the, the police refused to secure them, so they had to get in private security. Government hospitals were, were refusing to uh, receive uh, some of the people who are injured. They had to get, they, they had to get their own uh, private hospitals. Some private hospitals even rejected them, but they were able to come together. You saw doctors among them coming together and treating people. They even had a helpline within two weeks. For me, I am so optimistic, and I know that Nigeria, we've gotten to a place where we'll never get before. It's just like the educated mind. Once educated, can never come back to the state it used to be before. And the high-handedness from the government is because the government truly is afraid because it knows that the Nigerian voice has been awakened. Thank you very much. Would you run for public office if the opportunity presented itself? I don't know. Honestly, I'm very lazy. And, and for me, I'm very... Uh, I'm, 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 I'm somebody who I'm very honest with myself and I know what my strengths are and my, what, what my weaknesses are. And I've, that's always how I have lived all my life. I don't think I would be that interested. One of the things I know that, for example, an appointment or working for anyone is a no, no, never, ever. In terms of politics, I might not know. Maybe one day I will be less, uh, less uh, lazy and less selfish because I'm the kind of person I love to control what I do how I do it, when I do it. I'm a control freak. So I don't want a situation where I'm accountable to the people. If I decide I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk. If I don't want to talk, I'm not going to work. So for me, that's a major issue. And then also the father. I'm not much of a process person, person who says that, oh, this has to be done. I'm more of a, like, I see what needs to be done. And I will tell you this, even in my business, that's what I do. But although other, what, what I normally would do is I have a team that work. So they do they do the work. So I, I, I'm not sure. I would, I would say... Most likely, no, but maybe so when I'm less selfish and then I feel like I want to serve because right now, honestly, I really don't want to serve and it's not a good thing. And I see some people try to look at it from the far. Oh, no, 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 it's actually not a good thing. But uh, maybe one day if, 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 if I want to, but for now, no, I don't think so. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. And let me just say, keep doing what you do. It's making a break, great impact. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, bro. And happy birthday in advance. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I've been enjoying this. And um, among us is a distinguished professor of gender studies, uh, Professor Bridget Tibo. She actually writes on many, as you are talking, I'm connecting myself with her books and essays. She wrote a book on unruly women, talking <laughs> about... Um, how society perceives them when they disagree. But more interestingly is that she's writing on a mother oh. who, was, who was an activist of a different kind. Thanks for joining us. 
Professor That's Timo. Good. Maybe one day I will persuade you to go and write a book on, on um, Aisha Yesufu <laughs> and, and, and go to Abuja to, to collect the data. Uh, well, we want to move on with the program. Is getting, thank you all the professors, but this is what we have been waiting for, this, the, the younger generation. We are going to face out the older generation and now welcome <laughs> a, a younger generation uh, to, to, to join us. And in, 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 in this younger generation, we will bring another person, Nathan, he got involved in the NSAS program as a major photographer of the movement. So the students will field questions to you and Nathan. So, mm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, hello everyone. Uh, I'm getting everything set up. I'd just like to let you, uh, to carry on with what the professor just said. So we're adding Nathan on right now, and he is, he was involved with the NSARS movements and the protests and he has been extremely has been has played a very prominent role in the movement although sorry i think we might have a problem at the moment well, if you're having a problem can we be can we go with questions yes i think um, yeah, for now I, I see one question that has been coming up uh, that i would love to to to, to, please, to take up and answer Okay, thank you so much. So I think I because oh I'm not I am not I didn't open the chat. The question. Can you ask mention the person's name? Oh, I can't. I think I okay. That means I'll have to go to the chat. Don't worry, but mm -hmm. as the question, I will ask oh, him, okay. and I oh, will okay. actually mention the person's name. Oh yeah, okay, the person's name. So I I saw quite a number. I saw someone who was say something about oh why didn't I hold my husband accountable? Uh he's allegedly supposed to have stolen uh, money from NHIS. So I think I saw some of that going on. So the thing is that, uh, you, you know, uh, it's really funny that in Nigeria, when you stand to speak, uh, they will look for everything and everything to just uh, put at you. And I'm one person who I always say to people, well, first of all, I don't really care what people say. And whatever allegation that you say, if my husband has stolen money, please, we will get him into jail. That's what EFCC is supposed to be about. And I, I've said this before, and I'm going to repeat it again, I hold myself to higher standards than I hold anyone else. The person that is at the NHIF, his name is Professor Usman, uh, Usman Yusuf. I've never seen him. I don't know him. He was the one that was ES. Uh, he was the one that was accused of uh, carrying away, uh, is it uh, six vehicles or seven vehicles uh, to, uh, away, and involved in about 900 million naira uh, 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 fraud. Uh, he was sacked by the, the then uh, Minister of uh, Health. And then when he was sacked, the, the president reinstated him. And then that was, I think he was sacked in 2018. The president reinstated him. And then finally, the president then sacked him in 2019. And I see a lot of people whom I call Buhari, those who are always attacking me, you know, came up and said, that, oh, he's my husband. No, he's not my husband. I've never seen him. And please, the prosecution can go on. Before then, yes, my husband did work uh, at NHIS. He worked there for eight years, from 2000 and is it five to about 2013 was when he left there. And when my husband got uh, that job, I, I, I wrote him a letter and I said to him, you're going into public service. My husband, by the way, is a chartered accountant. He, is a, he has been a, char is a chartered accountant of over 30 years. And he had worked uh, in, in a particular accounting firm. And that was first of all KPMG. Then he now worked with Akintola Williams for 16 years before he, he went to, uh, uh, to, to go for public service, which he did only uh, eight years. And I said to him, you don't touch anything there. And I know the kind of man I married. And he had values. And when he got into NHIS, and the records are there, I've said to them, please, if you think my husband has done anything, come and arrest him. I will help you to prosecute him. He will go to jail, but we will continue our love in jail. When he comes out, then I'm going to ask him all this time that we're suffering to, to, get, to give our kids the best of education. So you had money somewhere and we're all suffering and everything. So I don't understand where this comes from. First of all, let me repeat, professor, and he's a professor now, and I just finished talking with amazing professors. 
But then Professor Usman Yusuf is the one alleged to have alluded uh, NHIS, definitely not my husband. Like I was saying earlier, my husband was the uh, GM uh, from 2005 to 2013. He was first GM uh, funds management, then GM finance and account. And he stood and protected the, the, the nation's menu. And NHIS had less than about 10 billion naira. Then when my husband was leaving, they left one, over 120 billion. And that's the money that repeatedly people have been, the whole corruption thing went on there. And I have dared the government severally and I've said to them, go and check those records. And I want you to come out and actually tell the world what my husband did there in ensuring that nothing was done within that period that he, 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 he held way over the uh, coffers. Uh, of the nation. And recently, of course, there was another this thing that they did where they were saying, oh, checking and finding out whether my husband took some money and that's the reason why I speak. I have been financially independent for even before my 40th birthday. That's part of the things that I worked, uh, worked for. I met my husband in 1996. In 1997, uh, when we started cutting, one of the things my husband said to me was that you have to be financially independent to be able to own your own voice. So it's something that I do. I actually teach financial literacy. I've been doing business since the year 2000. I'm a businesswoman. I'm a distributor for a good number of companies. And I build houses. I buy land. So I have my own money. I don't need somebody else's money to be able to speak on issues. I just needed to address that. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Yes. So Are we ready? Everyone... Yes, we're ready. Um, I'd like to introduce Nathan Cheyenne. Can you remove me from the... <laughs> yes, uh, goodbye, mm. Professor. <laughs> yeah. And um, Nathan Cheyenne, like I said, was has been played a prominent role in the NSARS protests. I think that he represents a voice of the voice of the younger generation in some ways because um, he's been on the streets, he's been cat cataloging the events, and he's been involved heavily. Um, I'm also going to bring on another member, a member of our crew. Her name is Sira. She is a student here at the University at Texas at Austin. And today she'll be asking questions. Hello. I just wanted to thank you guys so much for coming. We really appreciate it. So um, the first question that I have is going to be from Joy Usuji. And the question is, as activists, what critical steps should be taken in Nigeria to stop government corruption right now? Okay, so oh, I should go ahead with the answer. Or yes, I would love to hear from oh. both of y'all. So, so, so the 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 critical steps that need to be done right now is to first of all fix our politics. We can't fix Nigeria without fixing our politics. We need to ensure that we get people with competence, character, capacity people with empathy, people who are patriotic into office. And when we have them in office and they begin to work on having strong institutions, right now what we have are strong men and women and not strong uh, institutions and there's so much uh, abuse of that. And then so fixing politics is one of it. And how do we do that? By ensuring we have empowered electorates, by ensuring that the right kind of people run for office, and then by ensuring that the regulators are truly independent and are able to give uh, a, a fair, a fair a free and fair uh, election. So that's very important. The next thing, of course, is, is that we need to have an overhaul of the judiciary system. The judiciary system is the, is the biggest problem we have in Nigeria. Even the politicians that we have in offices, how did most of them get there? It's true tribunal and everything. You begin to see one judgment, one way, skilled judgment, one way or the other. So there needs to be a reform uh, of the judiciary uh, system and everything. And so these are two critical uh, things that we need to do. And most importantly also, which has to do with having the right kind of people in office is to ensure education. I've always said democracy without education is a disaster. And we need people who are educated. We need free, good quality education, especially primary and secondary school level. Today, for me, the greatest injustice in Nigeria today is that access to good quality education is dependent on the economic status of one's family. And that's a crime because Education is the, uh, is, the, is the easiest way to break the, the, the shackles of poverty, is the leveler. And yeah, here we have a lot of people who are being denied uh, that education and then politicians end up weaponizing uh, illiteracy and they weaponize poverty and perpetrate themselves in office. Thank you. Uh, one second, before 
Nita and answer that corruption question. Can you introduce yourself and what you did? All right. Um, my name is Nathan Cheyenne. Um, where do I start from? What do I do? I'm a creative producer. Um, what else? What else do I need to do to introduce myself? Anything specific, particular? Like my internet has been going in and out, so exactly. I've been missing a couple of things here and there. So, um, I, I would I would say right uh, since we're talking about a lot of activism now, right? I think tell us about how. First of all, tell us about you already tell us you're a creative creative producer, right? But tell us a little bit more about how you got involved with the Ansars protest, right? Why you got involved with it, mm. and yeah, things like that. Mm. Um, so a bit of backstory for me. Um, I study communication, culture, and media. Um, and for me, culture has been very, very important, and communication and media, and they all are intertwined in so many ways. And I feel for me, injustice to one person in any way is an injustice to all, because we as people who claim to be righteous people, who claim to be God-fearing people, who, who claim to always do what's right, when these things happen and we stand by and watch it happen, we are no better than the people that we're trying to fight. So when this protest started, personally for me, I've been a victim of police brutality in so many ways. And it's an ongoing thing for me daily. It's not just a one-off thing for me. It's things that I go through coming from work and going back home. You know, for a lot of people, young people, a lot of us fear the police more more than we actually fear criminals, mm -hmm. right? And just the mentality of that in a country that's supposed to be progressive, that's, that's, that's supposed to be democratic and supposed to have leaders who are there to serve us and a, a police who are meant to protect and serve us, for us to be there saying that we are more afraid of them than criminals, it's a very big statement. So for me, being out there, before all this happened, I felt that I'd already been having conversations with a lot of people about what will happen if, you know, Nigerian youth should come out and protest. It was, it, it was a conversation I'd been having already a year in advance of this. So when all this started happening, like for me to give myself fully to the cause was not even like a, I didn't even second guess it for, for one second because it was a thing now was of, we're fighting for our lives, like Aisha said, you know, earlier, you know, this is this is a protest and, and a movement where we're really fighting for the right to live. That's really what we're asking for right now. And obviously it's opened doors to so many things that we've seen, you know, that's wrong with the system in Nigeria, that's wrong with governance in Nigeria, and it's wrong with politics in Nigeria. But I think just to, in summary, um, answer Obina's question is that, and then to answer your question, you know, corruption. Aisha said pretty much a lot of what I feel should be done, but also on a more basic level, you know, like I said earlier, it starts from you as a person and us as the people within your immediate environment. Corruption has eaten so much into our culture. It's a culture right now in Nigeria, and I feel that it's eaten so much into our culture that it's become part of our daily lives, and I feel we have to cleanse ourselves also as much as, you know, that there, there, there needs to be an overhaul of the judicial system that it needs to be you know a, a critical look into governance in nigeria we as people within our immediate environment need to understand that culturally corruption is eating into our families and need to cleanse ourselves of that and that will able better help us to able move forward you know with clear minds of knowing how to solve problems too thank you so much that this is amazing information that honestly we love to hear. I want to pass the next question on to um, Maria, who has also been working on this team. Hi, my name is Maria. Like Sarah just kindly introduced me and I am so very glad to be on this call with you and to be speaking with you. Uh, thank you for everything you've already shared about all the things that you're fighting for. And from you know that perspective, me being in Nigeria, being on the ground, doing the grassroots work and how important that is to movement like this that's become global. Uh, one of my questions for you is, or for the both of you is how can the, or how can, um, this movement continue to be sustained past what we've already seen now? How can the momentum continue? Um, a lot of people have been asking about 
um, now that you know the NSARS protests are kind of um, they are not uh, as popular anymore and they're um, dying down a little bit. How uh, can we continue to motivate people to um, go out on the streets and protest and keep fighting? Okay, so we need to go first, Nathan? Yeah, go ahead, Aisha. Uh, okay, uh, so, so basically, uh, like, uh, one of the things that has consistently consistently be said is that it's a it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. So it's not something about saying, oh, oh, okay, we have to be on the street, blah, 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 and then it happens today. No. First of all, the first thing that has been done is the awareness that has been created. And a lot of people are more, especially the young people, are more now into what is happening in the country, and they're already looking at different things. They just finished a, a meeting, a Zoom meeting on the way forward, and different people are taking on, on to different uh, aspects of nation building, because they now know that, first of all, they have the numbers. Uh, first of all, they have the intelligence. They have the organizational skills. They have shown it in two weeks, and they can have the unity. They also and they they, they, they have tested that. So they're working towards building a Nigeria. Working, looking at politics. I mean, in in, in my country, politics is looked upon as a dirty thing to do, and I think that's being uh, thrown away. They, they're working on that. They're working on uh, awareness creation, most especially amongst the people who didn't understand what this is all about. Even yeah. amongst the talks that were deployed to attack the NSAS protesters. Most of them have felt the brunt of, uh, of uh, 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 police brutality. They felt police brutality, but they were forced to be there because they needed that many. And that's what comes from when uh, poverty has been weaponized. And so a good number of them are already engaging, are looking at how to engage them, empower them to ensure that at the end of the day, they are not ready tools that are going to, uh, going to be used. And also talking about the fact that there's this uh, need for inter intergenerational bridge. I mean, like some of, I've heard some of the NSAS protesters talk about the fact that, okay, youth were used against them. So they too need to use the older generation against mm -hmm. uh, the oppressors uh, that, they, that they have uh, right now. So quite a number of uh, things have been done. But for me, the most important thing is that awareness that indeed there is a voice. And when you're united, you can actually use that voice to achieve results. And with what has happened in the US, of course, right now, again, it has reinforced uh, that belief in them to know that when people, come together and fight for a particular thing, definitely uh, they, they will get it. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I, I definitely mirror everything Aisha said. I think just to add to that, I think first of all, um, like she said, we've gone through like an awakening, you know, some sort of awakening right now as a country, not just as youth, but as a country, because everybody who claims that maybe they didn't see that there was a problem in Nigeria has clearly seen that there are a lot of fundamental problems. And things that we're saying right now are not things that are new. We're just amplifying so much of the problems that have already been happening years and generations over time. That's one. Two, I think what needs to happen next is empowering, you know, empowering the youth also, because I feel it's very important to note that, you know, um, growing up, a lot of us learn certain things. A lot of us learn certain aspects of history that maybe have not been very accurate, maybe have not been, you know, very factual, and maybe also not the full history of the country. So education and empowering them to know that they have the power to use their voice. And I just said this earlier, as a democracy, the people who have the most, the, 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 the most power are the people. Those are the people who have the most power. And people need to understand that their voices their demands and things that they want met are like paramount because the leaders are there to serve us. And people need to understand that at a very basic level from as young as possible, like she said, the primary, even from growing up before people even go to school, like understanding that from the household that you have as much power, more power than you could actually, actually think of as a citizen of a country to demand better for yourself. It's not something that you need to beg for. It's not something that you have to ask for. You demand it as a citizen of a country. And then also when we talk about sensitization, going into you know, communities, because personally, I'm not the average Nigerian. I'm privileged, and I know that. The average Nigerian is not me. And knowing what the needs of the average Nigerian are help us to even know how we can solve certain problems better. Because the average Nigerian, and I talked about this with some other people, you know, you won't see someone who is privileged being a part of the police force 
for on so many levels, right? A lot of people who are put in, in the police force right now and, and you know, protecting and serving are victims of a society that has not been kind to them are victims of a system that have not done them well. So in moving through that society and navigating, they're always in their mind, it's a struggle mentality. You know, I have to make mine for myself because I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And a lot of them start off from schools, from the homes. So changing that mentality right now in a lot of our public schools, in a lot of our, our communities is very, very important right now because as, you know, battles are, are being fought on, on the front of people trying to see how they could change, you know, not necessarily change, but, you know, effect ways to have better governance. On the other end, we should be at the same time simultaneously letting the young ones know, because a lot of the change, we say we want to see it in our generation, but like we say, it's a marathon. It's going to take some time. And I feel as a lot of this older generation is phasing out in government, the younger ones are starting to build a new culture of what good governance is, of what it means to be, you know, you know, uh, 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 um, what was the word? Um, what it means to do the right thing, what it means to live in a country and demand better and get it, what it means to be a leader in a country. And I think they need to start understanding that from a very young age. And as they grow, the culture would have to start changing by itself. You wouldn't have to do anything too out of the ordinary. By the time they start learning it, that culture is going to be changed by them. Because right now, the system, for me, is not broken. It's working exactly how it's meant to be working, to oppress the people who they feel have the least power. And that's why I feel right now about moving forward. Uh, it, it, let me just add something also to, uh, to what Nathan has said, the way he talked about the average Nigerian. And uh, one of the, and he not being the average Nigerian, one of the things that happened with the NSAS movement is, is was that there was a convergence of, you know, the elite and the non-elite. So mm -hmm. first of all, these are young Nigerians who have never met on any level. And in Ooh. the last 10 years, I've been shouting that we have a major problem in Nigeria. In those days, children will meet in school, whether you're from privileged home, you're from the less privileged home, you all met in public schools. Yeah. But right now, because access to good quality education is dependent on the economic status of one's family. So children of the same economic status are the ones who are meeting in their niches. And at one time, they all, after primary school, secondary school, they will meet in the university. But right now, because we have private universities, which are out of the reach of the children from less privileged home, and then most of them go abroad, they are no longer even meeting at all. And for me, one of the ways that this got into me was one time with my daughter, we were talking about her international passport. And then she was talking and then she felt everybody had international passport. So myself and my husband, we looked at her and we laughed. And we were like, what makes you think everybody? And she looked at us and she said, well, everybody in my school has international passport. And that was when it dawned on me that, look, we have separated mm -hmm. the children into classes that they are no longer meeting each other. But with the NSAS protest, there was that they were able to come together, meet together, and actually fight uh, for, 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 for something that affects that affects all of them all. And I think that's a beautiful thing. And for, for our government to try to uh, to put a wedge on that, that, that's almost heinous. We need to encourage that. We didn't allow them to meet all this one. Now they're forming this beautiful relationship working together to have a great nation, the least we can do is to support them. Thank you. Yeah. So um, everyone, thank you very much for participating in this section. For now, Sarah and Maria have are done and um, I will be coming on to speak now. The <laughs> so hello everybody, my name is Obina Akahara and I'm a producer here with the follow the Tony Follow Light interviews. And this is just a continuation of the student section or I guess the, the young people section, so to speak. Um, what I'm going to be doing is taking some questions from the audience, but also adding in some of my own questions too, to kind of interrogate some of the things that you've already said and some ideas that you guys have um, posed in the interviews so far, and also just in general. And I think one of them, the first one I'd like to start off with is from Miss, Miss Bimbola Adelakun. And this one is for Nathan, actually. Um, she says, mm -hmm. photos are an incredible motivating factor in protests. 
they can easily mobilize people and speak to us with an immediacy and that trounces long speeches, right? She wants to know, how do you go about taking your pictures and what inspires you whenever you're doing that, especially in the moment? What what do you do? I feel um, with photography and any form of, of media, it's all storytelling, you know. It's, it's with photojournalism too, it's all storytelling and you have to control the narrative yourself also, you know. Every time I was out there, no matter what I was doing, even if I wasn't physically, there were a lot of times my camera fell down, you know, but, you know, I'm going live and taking pictures at the same time. But I feel that I have a duty to, to carry what is going on out there to people who are not able to see it firsthand. And if I'm not taking pictures personally, right, where I feel like I know that I'm in the heat of everything and my voice might not be heard, but I know like what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing out there would be seen. I have to think about it in, in carrying the truest form of what is going out there, you know, and, and out there a lot of the times I had issues with a lot of, 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 you know, media houses that will come and try to interview people. And, you know, they take the footage back and edit it and pay, make it to, to fit a certain narrative, you know? And, you know, what really annoyed me was one of the first times we were protesting, I think a certain news channel that I'm not going to mention, you know, put the protest under entertainment, right? Which, which was such a, 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 a mind boggling thing to, to, to even think about. And this was when the protest was first beginning. And from that day, I told myself that if anybody wants to find out about the protest, if you're a news person or, you're, or you're, you work with the, with the media, go live. Everybody's getting that information real time. You all have platforms where you can go live and, and show people what's actually going on out there. Don't take videos, mix people's words up and make them sound like something that they're not. That's on, on the side of video. But pictures, I feel like you have to be present in what is going on, but at the same time, looking for those moments within the process or looking for those moments within, you know, um, um, the madness that would speak to emotions for a lot of people. You know, like the photo of Aisha, you know, I, I came across that photo and I met the photographer by chance because I was taking pictures. And, and you know, we all start talking about how, you know, being out there, it's a risk for us to with our equipment, you know, it's a risk for us to run in and, and carry things at the same time too. So, but we understand that we have a duty as people who take pictures, who, who, who those stories to carry that truest form of what's going out there because we will not allow anybody else to control our narrative. Thank you, thank you. And um, I'll like say for this section, some of the questions might be blunt, but I'll try my best. So um, I think this one is for both of you and I guess I should pose it to Miss Aisha first. It's, in summary, what's next, right? These protests, like you said, have been going on for a long time and they really picked up coming in, in October, right? But after the incidents at Lekki Tollgate and a bunch, a lot more, a lot more violence that the government has, I guess, imposed on the Nigerian people, what do you think is next? How, what, where do, where do you think things are going to go? Do you think people still have that motivation now that their lives are on the line? Well, the thing is that people's lives have always been on the line. I mean, it's just that the thing, the thing with uh, Nigerians is that we look the other way when things are happening in Nigeria. In December 2015, uh, the military opened fire on, uh, on, on Shiites, uh, Shiites in Zaria and killed yes. over 700 citizens. I mean, people look the other way. Some people even yeah. uh, defended the military. Uh, IPOP, IPOP over the years have been killed repeatedly. Military have opened fires on them and killed them. But people looked the other way. We have, death has been going on uh, all, all, all the time. So it's not that, this is not the first time the police have killed our protesters a, a, lot, a, a lot of times. I, I remember Precious who works with uh, our channels, a, a young journalist was killed in one of the uh, protests, uh, the, the Shia protests. So all of this ha have been going on. So when people look at it and say that, oh, now that government have done this, uh, people wouldn't talk. No, that's not it. Because it, 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 it is that you either killed under the cover of darkness or you're killed uh, in broad daylight. That's, that's, that's where we are at now. What next is for people to become mm. more active? 
Whatness is for people to begin to yeah. look at politics. Whatness is for people to begin to participate in governance. Silence is not an option. And like I would yeah. personally always say, they don't have enough bullets for all of us. And when they're talking about this, let people speak. What we have is that people think that they have the patent to prayers. So when they pray, it's never going to be their turn. But guess what? The last victim also prayed, but it didn't stop them stop it from being uh, that, that victim's turn. And the victim card is, is going all around. And it, it doesn't make sense. And I always say to people, look, those who have been killed will not be killed again. The next to be killed are those of us that are alive. So it is in our own interest to ensure that we speak against this injustice. We put a stop to it. We begin to find ways to ensure that we have sustainability in the kind of society that we want. It's a society where the rights of everyone is respected, in the society where people don't have to beg uh, for them to be alive. The things that we need to do right now at this moment is that we need to start taking interest Oh, sorry, I don't know if you can hear us, but your video is um the, the internet connection. I imagine is bad. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, it's, it's just um, it's just can you hear me? Yeah, it's, it's getting better now. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. So, one of the funny things in Nigeria is that people tend to hold fellow citizens accountable and keep enabling a environment for the people that have voted into office. Oh. Oh. Yeah, sorry, John, right? Yes, that's unfortunate. I think her internet uh, connection went bad. Oh, keep going, keep going. Yeah, but, but Nathan, actually, I think this is probably a good time for you. Like, yeah. what do you think is going to happen? Um, I'll check it out. Just to back off of um you know what Aisha said and I feel that you know what's next is a question that's being asked and you know there's no one answer for that I think everybody right now has a different vision of what they want for Nigeria and I feel that you know if you ask me it'd be a different you know answer than what somebody else who's my age or who's been out there is because as much as all these problems affect us you know all as a whole it affects everybody differently you know I think for me in the short term you know the victims, you know, I think there's a reason we started this protest. And I feel that at some point, some form of justice needs to happen to prove to people and let people know that we, we can and we should hold perpetrators accountable for their actions, especially people who are meant to protect and serve and make sure that the justice served to them is a lesson to anybody else who wants to put that uniform on to protect and serve of the citizens and know that you you cannot take the law into your hands and like Aisha said you know a lot of us are uh you know some people say that some people in Nigeria are already there some people are, are, are walking you know corpses already because healthcare is bad you know people are suffering from from you know people live on 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 less than 300 naira a day you know people are roads bad roads are killing people so we are fighting, and like I just said, you know, the people who have died already are not going to die again. And if we don't do something right now, you know, the cycle is keep like it's it's, it's going to continue. And granted, I feel right now we have to look to other means, like we've talked about already, with, with you know sensitization and empowering people and education and 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 you know looking into good governance and like whatnot. But also, I think process is always going to be important in amplifying what is actually going on at the moment in any form of uh, like you know any issues that are going on it's always going to be important in letting people know hey in case you were sleeping this is what is going on right now but as that's going on i think all these other things that that, that we've talked about earlier you know are things that need to happen but um in the short term for me personally i feel like you know the victims are something that i personally hold dear to my heart because I personally haven't even processed all that's gone on through the protest of all the days that I was there when people were attacked, that my that, that my trousers were bloody, that days where I had to run for my own life. I haven't personally processed that because I feel that the victims need to have some form of justice because it doesn't make any sense to me where, for me personally, and this is me speaking as Nathan Shine, I could go about my life knowing that people have died have families, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, kids that 
they have to live without their loved one right now. And the government hasn't done anything in any way to show any remorse for what has happened. And people still have not been brought to justice. It does not sit right with me. So personally, right now for me, in the short term, I'm working on ways to see how we can amplify and put pressure on the government to let them know that, look, if this doesn't happen, we're going to keep applying pressure till we see some form of change or some form of even, oh yeah, we've heard you, let's start doing. Because people are still sitting in cells for offenses that they have not, that they never committed. And we have not even dealt with that yet. So I feel that there are issues in the short term we have to deal with as, as much as we have to do all these other things, for me personally. Yeah, you guys, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to have to add a, ask a few more questions um, <laughs> quite quickly because we're running out of time. Uh, I want to go back to one of the early questions that we had, and this is from Isaisha once again. You said that you grew up in the North, right? And uh, you already touched on this. Women's rights in Northern Nigeria are not, um, well, they're very bad, in my opinion. That's that's what I would say. What do you think can be done to help empower women in the North, or just to change some of the ways that women's rights are viewed? I also, what's your opinion on it first, actually? Uh, I, I, I think, yeah, the question, and I thought I had just heard something about women's rights and the North. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Let me try what's again. The question precisely. So, what do you think can be done to help improve women's rights in the north or to change the perception of women in the north uh, what needs to be done is education nothing more it, it, it's to first of all ensure that uh there's, there's education both uh, uh islamic education and western education and one of the things that uh, it, a, a whole lot of people have used to hold women down is that uh because a lot of women aren't educated uh, so they just tell them what it is about uh, what Islam has said or what the Quran has said, which is actually even a lie. And uh, I remember someone on Twitter, you know, just saying to me, "Oh, Aisha, you you are a disgrace to Islam. You are here. You 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 are protesting. You are doing this. You are doing that." And I said to him, "Well, the Islam that that I I, I am part of is the Islam where women went to war with their men and they fought mm. side to side with men." And then he comes to say to me. Oh, those ones they had, I had it even put it, that they had good motive. So first of all, if he was talking about different until he, he realized that I have a knowledge of that also. So I, I think basically it's, uh, knowing uh, education is very important. And that's why we have a lot of issue where a lot of people aren't, uh, they don't allow the girls to, to, to get that education. And then also financial independence, which is also very important. Because you find out that a lot of women that don't have work, don't have uh, their own means of taking care of themselves. So they are always dependent on people. Uh, sometimes when they are married on their husbands and when these husbands get tired of them, they drive them away to, to marry uh, younger uh, younger girls. And then they are just left on their own and they are forced to move on to, uh, uh, to get married again because they can't take care of themselves. And then most times this... Uh, husbands that they marry don't want their children. So it's an unending uh, generational uh, poverty that is being uh, 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 put together, uh, being recycled all, all the time. And we need to understand that uh, abuses are always you know, sort of like power based when they think somebody has nothing and uh, they, they will keep uh, suppressing the right. So there's a need, uh, like I said earlier, so I think the main thing is for education. Let girls be in school, let them finish uh, their education. And there should be legislation on stopping uh, the early marriage. And I see a lot of people, a lot, a lot of people will say, oh, you know, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he married uh, Aisha when she was quite young, and they use that as example. That's a prophet. That's not you. And we have to look at the fact that the prophet, even she was the only one that he married as a maiden. All the other wives he married were all, uh, either already married before the divorces or end of that. He, his first wife was about 15 years older than him. And they were together. She was the one that gave birth to his children. And when she died, before he started having uh, uh, other women. And each of them came with a particular reason why he was married. That he's the, only, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam you know, had about nine wives, but the limitation is four. So when they use that as an excuse, it, it's not at all. I always say that, have you married women older than you first before uh, doing this? And of course, education in Islam is compulsory both for the male child and also for the female child. There's no discrimination in, in Islam. But because we have a patriarchal society, we have people who, when it comes to 
they uh, uh, suppression. They always want to suppress women's rights. They will use the culture over that and then say that, oh, it's re religion. No, it, it, it isn't. And I think we need to do more with the education of our girls. Yeah. So let me follow up on that education question. Uh, one or two of you here will know, know about what I want to talk about. I spent a lot of time in trying to create a university for women in the North. Mm. In fact, um, I went as far as the Sultan who adopted the idea, who accepted it. I did more. I went to the president of Carnegie and I went to Aga Khan and one other, and they said, okay, it's going to be free. They will fund it. And now the depressing part. The Sultan agreed, but many of his chiefs said, no, no, no. And the rest I can put on video. I'm just telling you how, and one of you is here in this, I've seen the person here, join me in one trip to talk about women issues. And you can see that those resistant forces, they remain. And I kept asking myself, which is going to be my question. I can understand traditional ideas. I can understand ideas 100 years ago. I'm an historian, I understand them. But what I do not understand is, why do these ideas just refuse to persist? That's what I keep saying. I'm not even, talking about modernity. I'm not talking about cosmopolitanism. I'm talking about just something it should be very, because when I was presenting the argument, I wasn't presenting them as a revolution. I was just saying, okay, but, but they bring back the other argument of control. Okay, if the woman becomes a doctor, is she not going to get back to the household? And you just said, these arguments that are clear to me, just as they are clear to you, they're so difficult to sell. Okay. Um, oh, okay, so, uh, so- Just Paul, to add uh, real quick, Aisha, sorry. Okay. Just to add real quick, I think to what um, um, Prof said and what you said, I think representation is very important. I think more than anything, I feel that, you know, Right now, we need more female leadership. And like Prof said, you know, there are reasons why, you know, a lot of the patriarchy don't want, you know, women to be fully educated, don't want them to go about having, you know, the same kind of jobs that, that, that men do. Because there's a fear also, like, because of, of culture that, you know, the, the woman would not come back to the house, which is, 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 a, is a notion and a concept that's like, to me right now, is completely benign because things have changed, culture has changed, and we can't keep living that like we're, like we're back in the Stone Age, you know? Like we can't keep living that like, you know, progress hasn't happened, you know, for the past couple of years. So representation is very, very important in all of this, you know, that's, that's being said too. Absolutely. Uh, Nathan, that's, that's uh, spot on. A, a representation is, is very important. I mean, it's, it's, it's only women that will be able to actually talk about the women problem. I remember when the equality bill uh, was taken to the National Assembly, it was thrown yeah. out. And what were women simply asking? I mean, they want to also be able to inherit. They just want just, just a right to be treated as, as, as human beings. And then the National Assembly, of course, threw, threw that out. They couldn't understand it. Another thing, uh, beyond, I, I think uh, one of the things I would say to Prof, the people you spoke to, you had the meeting with, uh, both the Sultan and then uh, the chiefs and, and everything, if you find out from them, their daughters are in school. Their daughters have gone to school, mm. not just the best of schools, not just in Nigeria, but the best of schools also outside of Nigeria. So all of this has nothing to do with their own daughters, whom they have given the best of education and they have given them life. But what happens is the daughters of the poor people, the daughter, the general, the state. And the reason is very simple. If, you, if the status quo today favors them, the illiteracy in the North is an asset. 
An asset, where is this? Why is it an asset? It's a political tool to perpetuate yeah. themselves in power. It's a political tool that they will be able to use to declare who becomes president, whether it's not from the North, but whoever it is, they have a role. It gives that number. So for you bringing this idea to you, it might not be a revolutionary idea. To you, Prof, it might be, oh, this is the right thing to do. But when you're, what you're bringing is that you're going to take away the power that they have, the assets that they have used years to build. What happens with when women get, when women are educated, they're able to have uh, control over their lives. Uh, they're not going to be easy to that people will drive out of their house, even if they are driven away uh, from their houses. They, 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 they have the means of livelihood to take care of themselves and also their children. I bet if, if they have education, that's what happens, right? So without education, there are toys that can be used. Somebody marries them at very early age, 12, 13, 14, 15, they're married. Uh, by 25, they have lots of children, maybe probably 10, the person sent them away with the children. They don't have option rather than to get married again. By the time they marry uh, another person, the person doesn't want the children to come home. Guess where the children end up? They end up in the streets. And I grew up in the ghetto of Kanu. I grew up with most of those children who were sent in to come and do al -Majiri to come and learn from Somalis. And they end up doing what they end up not learning, having Islamic education. They don't have Western education. They never learn a trade. They are just there. And let me give you, paint a picture for you. They become young adults, teenagers and young adults who have no life, no job, no, no, no trade, nothing. They're just waiting for the next riot. I grew up with them where someone will borrow money from another person and just simply say to you, I'm going to pay you when the next riot happens. They live for riots because what happens is that when they have a weapon, that's when for the first time people look at them with respect. People look at them like human beings. Other than that, they're seen as dregs of society. So that, and these are the people that are used as bandits. These are the people that you just tell them, oh, come and vote uh, somebody. This is it, they will whip up sentiment. I mean, we saw where, Northern governors recently had a meeting and they had a communique. And in that communique, they thanked the Northern religious rulers and Northern traditional rulers for the role they played in the end South protest by whipping up sentiments, religious and ethnic sentiments. They were so brazen as to actually have that written in black and white. So when you bring all this issue of education, you're gonna take away that power and asset that they have. There's something that I always say to people, look at, I you know with uh, women, when women are empowered, it, it's amazing. It's a whole family that is empowered. And I say to uh, people, look at the southern part of Nigeria. And maybe the scholars amongst here will take that. That's some, one study that I would really love to sit down and actually do it, even though I just say it on, on, on looking at it, is that if you look at the southern part of Nigeria, there are, there are less children on the streets than there are in the northern part of Nigeria. Why? It's all because of the women. The women in the southern part of Nigeria, they work hard. They, are, they can go to market. They are the ones who are doing all sorts of jobs. They will do all manner of jobs, all jobs, trading. And so even if their, 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 their husbands are not able to take care of the children, they take it on. And I said to people, if you check a lot of people who have gone to either school, university, you see the huge role. Uh, that parents, uh, that these mothers played in ensuring that the children went to school. But you come to the northern part of the country where the women are not even allowed to trade, a good number of them, even when they have jobs, but maybe they are divorced, they have businesses, they are trading, the moment they get married, they are denied from doing that. And then what happens when the children are thrown away, they can't take care of the children, children end up uh, in, in the street, they are forced to marry. I used to wonder, you know, before growing up, it used to annoy me, I'm like, why do those people jump from marriage to marriage? I mean, somebody just got divorced three months because there's a, there's a waiting period in Islam that a woman stays, which is about three months, uh, three menstrual uh, period, wait, months when she stays before getting married. And immediately they finish that, they will get married. So it used to annoy me as a child growing up. I got into a, when I was a young adult and a, a, a mother and everything, I realized that the reason why they were doing that was because they didn't have the economic capacity to take care of themselves. So they have to move immediately to another marriage for them uh, to be taken care of. Uh, thank you, Prof. I don't know whether that answered uh, the question. It does. That's anyway. good. Um, yeah, so we're, we're actually, we've kind of run over time now. So I, I don't know if, 
this. Let's you have spend time five more minutes. Let's crave the indulgence of them um, because they're tired now. But let's yes. five more minutes. So the last if thing. See any good question? Just post it. Yes. So the last question that I've had from people is. Um, Sorry, everyone, by the way, I can't get all the questions, but this one I think has come up a lot, right? And it ties back into the one I asked previously and also what Nathan said, right? What can people do to change the polity right now, right? What can people, and the government right now is trying to push the anti-social media bill, which is, um, which I, I don't know what your opinions on it, but it's kind of stripping the people of their voice. So what can people do to change the polity? What can the diaspora do to help change the polity or the politics of the country? Unfortunately, people have already died. Um, yes, but yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, so for me, I think one of the biggest things that people can do, especially let me start from Nigeria to Nigeria, is the fact that we need to start building bridges. We need to build bridges across people. There are so many people who are not educated. And I always say that, look, the education that we have is not for us alone. It's for millions of others who didn't have the opportunity uh, to be educated. And so we need to begin to speak to them, not in a condescending manner or a patronizing manner, but coming down and sitting and having a conversation uh, with them on what is happening. We need to teach them about governance. We need to get empowered and electorate. And every one of us will become that teacher where we are sharing this little knowledge for them to understand the relationship between governance and their life. I mean, there's a woman in the market who says Ubu, who has worked all her life, able to get her, ch her children to university, but they don't have jobs. And she thinks it's an enemy. No, it's not the enemy. You need to explain to her that it's, it's all about governance. It's because the economy is contracting. The shops, and there are no enabling environments for businesses to thrive. And the businesses are closing down, new ones are not opening, the jobs will be few, and they will get it. So it is not enemies, it is not um, a spiritual thing or the other. These are some of the explanations we need to do. So there's a need uh, to uh, to get people educated. Sit with that person who is a security man at your gate. Talk to the person and uh, just enlighten them. Let's begin to make that an issue so that people understand the power of uh, that they have, the power that they have, and that you know, be collecting five thousand naira or two thousand naira at the end of the day won't be what we solve the problem. And also, uh, looking for a way of empowering people in a way that they can be able to to have a life of their own. It's not going to be easy, but we, we just have to find uh, a way of, of doing that. In the case of Nigerians in diaspora, one of the things that I have consistently asked is the question: What are Nigerians in diaspora doing to have political power? Nigerians in diaspora contribute. To, uh, to, to the economy of our country. I think about four, four or more percent of GDP is contributed by the Nigerian About 25 economy. billion dollars. About 20 something billion dollars in the mid back home every year. That's a huge economic power, but then contribution, but then when it comes to politics, you're, you, you, you're helpless in, in a way. So there is a need for Nigerians and diaspora to begin to agitate, to be, to be able to vote. You have millions, we have millions of Nigeria out there, and those millions can actually shape, I think they are talking about 10 million Nigerians out of in diaspora. They can shape the election. With what today we win and the presidency, the last time was about 15 million uh, votes. You can shape the election. You have what, uh, you have power of influence. The people that you send money back home to, you can influence the decisions they make. You can talk to them. You can educate them and let them know because it doesn't make any sense for them not to hold their government uh, responsible and for all the problems to be put on you. Somebody is coming to ask you to pay for their children's uh, school fees. You wouldn't need to pay children's school fees if we had good quality, uh, free, good quality uh, education, primary and secondary school. You wouldn't need to pay for health care if there were, we had good hospitals where people can get treated. So there's a need to begin to do that and use that power of uh, influence to educate the people. And then this influence that you have, if they know your direction, your political direction, they, they will, they, most of the people you have, whether they're in the villages, whatever, they will listen. And this are uh, some of, of the things uh, that, that need to be done. Um, most importantly also is for them to engage 
the, the countries they are in to engage the government, to engage their parliament, to engage their senate, house of rep, for the in terms of what is their foreign policies, to focus on Nigeria and let them talk about the issues that are happening in, in Nigeria, most especially with this police brutality. One of the things that normally happens, sadly, is the fact that the Nigerian government does not does not care about the Nigerian voices, but it, it cares more about the voices coming from outside because for them it's all about the optics they want to look good and so when when we have voices from outside speaking on issues uh they take it on so they they have and, and one other thing i forgot to mention of course is that if nigerians in diaspora have have capacity to vote they will not be threatened uh they will not they will not use talks on them they cannot use a uh, come and buy their votes with five thousand naira, and then of course they are all known their numbers are there so that would really uh, shape uh, the uh, what is going on. I just see a question that keeps re repeating itself where uh, they are talking about uh, fear of whether we are not scared for our lives. Well, of, the thing is that uh, I was I was less than 10 years old when I said to myself, the worst thing any human being can do to me is to kill me. And that is not the worst thing anyway, since I'm going to die. So for me, I, I, I live by th at that. And for me, death is not, it's not when I can no longer breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide carbon dioxide, that for me would be when in the face of injustice, tyranny, oppression, I'm unable to speak because I'm afraid to die. That for me would, would really be death. There has been, of course, recently there have been many uh, calls for me to be killed, most especially in the North, where they say I'm anti-Islam, I'm this and that. It is what it is. And I always believe that those who have died before, we are not better than them that they died. And at the end of the day, uh, we will die one day. I'm a Muslim and I believe that the day I'm going to die is the day I'm going to die. Nobody is going to change that sooner or later. And if somebody feels that they're going to put a bullet through my head, well, that's their own uh, personal business. I would rather fight, die standing with my voice, the bullet in my head, and, than to die a coward where somebody will just call me. I'll be a sitting dog and somebody will just kill me. Thank you. Well, let me call on some of our guests to thank um, Nathan and Aisha for us. Uh, Professor Tibor, Bridget Tibor, can you thank them? You can make a few comments. Can you unmute her, please? So that she can thank our guests for us. She has two comments or one. Um. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, wherever you are. Uh, this has been a wonderful experience um, and pleasure to have both Aisha and Nathan on this platform. We have been inspired by you, and we really want to thank and appreciate you for all what you've, you're doing and for, for the taking to speak for the underdogs to make sure that um, your voices be heard to make sure that the grievances of regular poor people who don't have access can be heard. And um, we want to commend you for doing the right thing. And we know that with people like you um, talking on behalf of everyone else with the, the photographs that Nathan has been posting and all the activism that you both channel there is hope after all for um, Africa. And I'm definitely going to be using some of your clips in my classrooms um, for young students here at the University of Massachusetts in Dartmouth. So thank you so much. And thanks Professor Falola for putting together this wonderful uh, conversation and interview. Yeah. Thank you. Hopefully we'll be meeting thank again. You. Thank you so much, Nathan. Thank you, Aisha. Professor, thank you. Thank you, Professor thank you. Zegbo, one word from you, please. Professor Isaibo, can you unmute her, please? Is she there? Um, I believe so. Um, please, could you increase her name again? A-K-A-C-H-I. Yes. Um, sorry, she's coming on. I believe. Um, Oh, sorry. I don't think I don't think I'm able to reach her at the moment. You're not able to reach her. Yes. Doctor Siri Lobby, are you there? Oh, sorry. I think she's back. Akachi is back. Let me see. No, I don't think so. Okay. It says so, we have to ask her to unmute. Yes, Mister Mister Siri Lobby is here. Okay. Yes. 
Professor Cyril Obi, you want to thank them for us and make some comments? Well, um, thank you very much, Professor uh, Professor Falola. This has been a, a fantastic event. I want to register my appreciation to Aisha and Nathan, and also all the participants and to your students and everybody that has been part of this hugely successful event. Uh, I have learned a lot. I have really learned a lot uh, from the interactions here. And it's given me hope for the future of Nigeria. Um, I just want to say something about public education. And I would like to have Aisha's reflections on what is the state of public education in Nigeria, particularly higher education. The universities, the public universities have been closed for months. Um, what, do you, what is your vision of a kind of public education that would truly serve uh, the vision of the Nigeria that you have? Thank you so much, Professor Falala, once more for putting this uh, great uh, event and uh, trust that I'm going to be one of your very regular viewers of the Falo Tony Falala interview series. This is fantastic. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, can I go ahead? Go ahead. I thought, uh, okay. I thought we, won't so ask, we won't ask you to answer questions anymore. But go ahead. <laughs> no problem. It's, it's okay. I'll, I'll go do that. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you so much. For me, um, I, I have great passion for education, honestly, because the only reason why I'm sitting here today is because of the education that I had. And, uh, and, and that basically was my secondary school education. At primary school, I went to a public school. I started a uh, public secondary school. And then because I was such a sickly child, uh, it was a boarding school, my parents taught. And then I left there and I, I came down, I was in form two and I came to a, pri a private secondary school where I started from form one. And that school was at the B uh, Bayero University uh, staff secondary school. So we were, we were the pioneers. And if you were to see me with my siblings, there's a huge difference. And what that difference simply is, I ended up uh, going to uh, by BUK, where I had my uh, uh, um, uh, BSc in microbiology. The difference is in the uh, secondary school that I, that, that I had, uh, uh, secondary school education that I had. When I finished from the secondary school, I went, uh, when I left the secondary school, my government secondary school, I couldn't speak English very well. I remember being in BUK South Secondary School and they would make fun of me because I couldn't speak English. And the first essay we wrote, I didn't know, I didn't know my punctuation. I didn't know full stop. I didn't know paragraph. I knew nothing. I just, you know, put something out there. But meanwhile, from the secondary school, government secondary school I was coming from, I was like the star, the star student. And there was a term that we only did four subjects. A Hausa, IRK, economics, and I can't remember what the fourth one. It definitely wasn't math, uh, math and English were it included. A whole time, these were four subjects uh, that, that we did. And so for me, that passion for education has always been there. From one that they made from fun of for not being able to speak English to the extent that by the time, I, when they laugh at me, I would just say to them, okay, when they're done with laughing, what's the right way to speak it? And even up to today, there are so many words that I don't know how to pronounce. I can write them, but I just avoid them when I'm speaking. I'll use the words I, I, I can use because, of course, growing up, I didn't have TV to see uh, all, all, all of this. I, there's a reason why I'm giving all of this uh, uh, background uh, context, so what, 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 the answer I'm coming to. And so I finished secondary school. Today I'm, I'm sitting down here. It's just because of education. Education is the left. When you're poor, you're able to get to school. You can aspire to be anywhere and everywhere. And today we have a problem. In the last over 10, 15 years, I've been saying that, look, the rate at which Nigeria is going, we'll get to a place whereby it is only government that, that will be employing people from the private universities, and I'm sorry, from the public universities. And I think we're already getting there. First of all, it started with NUT. What is happening to us today they started with NUT, the Nigerian Union of Teachers for the public primary and secondary school. I would not, they will go on strike and nobody will be bothered. They will stay over a year, nobody will care. Why? Because it's only children of the poor that are in public schools. Every other person, no matter how bad it is, they found a way to be in private schools. No matter how the private schools are not that good, they will do something. Today, our universities have been closed for, for, over, at, for about over 10 months and there's no end in sight. Meanwhile, the private universities are going on. 
And the private universities, only those who have the economic power that can pay for them. And then we have others, our uh, children are abroad, they're out of the country. So what we have to do going forward, for me, I have always said, the Nigerian government should take its hand off uh, uh, university education. The focus should be on primary and secondary school education. Let universities truly be autonomous. You cannot say that universities are saying, Nigerian universities are saying they, they want to be autonomous. They are autonomous, but they don't want to be financially independent. They don't mm -hmm. want to have that financial autonomy. You cannot have a situation whereby the focus is not on, I, will, I always say, and I might be wrong, the professors are always correct me. The primary and secondary school education is the one that is most important. It's the one that at least, you know, for the, for, the, for the nation, we need everybody to have good quality, basic education, primary, secondary school. University, yes, some might decide they want to go to university, some might decide they want to go to, to do other things beyond going to university because at the, at the stage of the university, you are specializing. So if instead of government focusing and have just left the uh, 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 primary and secondary school education to local government that is almost non-existent, non and then you have people, they come up and you expect them to be uh, in, in this university is what they have. Right now, the reason why ASU has been forgotten, nobody really cares, it's just they're just dilly-dally, is because most people don't have their children there. Most of the people that matter really don't have their children there, so the other ones can stay for long. If we have a situation whereby universities are truly autonomous, universities can, for some people, it's okay, what about those who can't pay? The fees that are paid in Nigerian universities today, honestly, to be honest, is nothing to write home about. It's too small. And we have to be honest about it. I've had a lot of them come to me when they increase their school fees. Oh, Aisha, you need to speak on it. I said, look, I can't speak on it because personally for me, I think the fees that are being paid are already too small. There should be, if we have good quality uh, universities that are producing graduates that we can all be proud of, that can stand any test in the world, that will be better than the numbers we are churning out today. At the end of the day, most of the people are not employable. You see a Nigerian graduate cannot even write an application letter for you. And you're wondering, how did you pass through school? So if we have a situation whereby they are truly autonomous, they are independent, Good quality education coming out for me. Yes, the this, this fees will really go high. Let people, people don't need to spend money uh, paying for uh, 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 primary and secondary school education. If we had good quality, free good quality education at that level, let parents save for their children going to university. And then the indigent one can get scholarships, can get school loans, can get, uh, government can give them scholarship, scholarship. university can also, uh, give them a scholarship and all of that, then we'll begin to have people who truly need to be in, in the university, be in the university. There are a lot of people, not everyone has to be in the university. There are other places and avenues that people can follow. And then they'll be able to do that. But right now what we have, it's, it, it's, a, it's a body that is dependent on the, uh, on, the, uh, on the federal government. And then they don't truly want to be uh, autonomous on the issue. And everything is going haywire. And we have a certain kind of selfishness because most of the people, most of the lecturers that are teaching at the uh, public universities are also the ones who are teaching at the private universities. So if they don't feel anything right now, uh, universities, uh, private universities are on their teaching, they're earning their money, they earn double money, they don't care. It's the children of the poor at the end of the day that are suffering. And I think as a nation, really, we need to do something about our education because the taming population that we have, and I've said this to several people. I said, we spent so much money, millions of naira, to send our children to school here in Nigeria and abroad. But guess what? The teeming population of students who, are, who have not gotten that education will not allow our children to have the kind of life they're supposed to have. And that's what is happening right now. We see the way where the, the nation is. So we need to work on that educational system. And I think we need to really sit down and have a conversation on the, especially the, tertiary uh, uh, education and what we're going to do about it. This issue of where somebody is paying, uh, let's say for example, 30,000 Naira or 40,000, 40,000 Naira is how much? A hundred dollars is about uh, 37, uh, is that for something? For 47,000. Sometimes the, the money that people pay in the term is less than hundred dollars in the university. Who does that? And how do we expect to, to progress in that way? And then meanwhile, where we're supposed to really focus the education, we are not focusing on that. 
it's it's something that we have to be pragmatic and we need to sit down and really have a, a real uh, a conversation on our educational system. I think if we had a government who is worth its onion, there should be an emergency declared in the educational system. We need to get it together. And just let me add, even though this is not part of the question, I think we need to get to a place where we understand that there is there, there has to be a lost generation. This generation of Nigerians that we say, okay, we made a mistake here. They are not really educated. What can we do? In what way can we help them? And then look at children, for example, from five years below and say, look, we need to provide good quality education from there, right from the curriculum, right from the kind of teachers that we put in there. By the way, most people who become teachers uh, in our this in our people who don't have the best of results. They are the ones with their three uh, credits. They can't get uh, admission to university anywhere. Then they go to teacher training. These are the people we put in our schools, public schools to teach. So what are they going to teach when they themselves don't know anything? So we need to have a place where but from five years below, we say, look, those children from now on, we're going to focus on their education. We are going to take them on good schools with curriculum change, right kind of uh, people who are teaching Change, why are they paying people so much money who are working at NNPC? What are they providing when teachers aren't receiving anything? Get good quality teachers, pay them very well, have them in there, let them begin, let's begin to take this population. Then the other ones that are above, we begin to think, how do we manage them for the betterment of Nigeria? If we don't take care of the educational system in Nigeria, it's a, Nigeria is going to implode. It's only a matter of time. And I've consistently said it before, and I'm going to repeat it again, that revolution is imminent in Nigeria. It's either we have a bloodless revolution or a bloody revolution. And bloodless revolution will be done by those of us who are educated by we changing the systems. Otherwise, we're going to have a bloody revolution where those who are angry, who are hungry, will come at us and they will not know the difference between those who have been in government and have truncated governors and have been giving them bad governors and the rest of us who are just citizens who are making demands. Because having a clean uh, shed or having a mobile phone or living in a good house or having a job will make you a victim. And I hope that what we saw with the rest, recent uh, looting that happened of COVID-19 palliatives and how angry people were, we take that as a sign and begin to work for a great Nigeria. And the way we can do that is to get an educated populace. We have, we have the, the manpower, we need to get them educated. And by that, we'll be able to have the nation that we all want to have. Thank you. That is a very, very powerful closing statement. Once again, we thank you. I thank him. Um, so we 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 are very grateful that you are able to join us. Nathan, we're able to join us as well. We are grateful to all of you. We are very Thank grateful you. and we'll call off upon you once again. Um, and we are also for the purposes of students, we'll be developing models and we start with Afropolitanism. And the way we structure it is we as professors and students to talk about a certain concept so, so that if students anywhere in Africa, they are asked about that project, they already have a free uh, avenue to learn about it. Thank you very much. We're very thank good. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is, was a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much, Anna. So everyone. Bye, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you so much. I shall.